From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on March 28, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 34th episode of Matters Microbial. Those of you who watch and or listen and spread the microbial word to others, thank you so very, very much. Time marches on. I begin a two-year halftime phased retirement this coming spring, which means this is the last time that I will be teaching introductory cell and molecular biology here at the University of Puget Sound, and I have all the feels. So fun microbe-related items on my desk keep me focused, as you can see. The students in my intro course have been truly wonderful, and I keep them amused, especially with things like minus 80 degree thin mint cookies, so I can breathe like a dragon. My intro students have been following the tiny earth approach, as we've discussed before on the podcast, and are looking for bacterial isolates from soil, from moss, and from lichen that appear to inhibit relatives of pathogenic bacteria. Here's a student isolate from soil that creates a zone of clearing on a background of Acinetobacter. And one student group found two isolates from moss that appear to inhibit Enterobacter. This really gives the students a sense of accomplishment and understanding of basic science. Plus, it's relevant to our increasingly antibiotic-resistant world. I am always so, so happy that my students really look at their plates. Please notice that the three isolates from moss by this student group behave a particular way on a background of E. coli, but the three isolates behave so differently on a background of Micrococcus and a background of Staphylococcus. We had a lot of fun discussing why the differences exist. Microbes interact in interesting and often unexpected ways, and observation remains key. Quick podcast note, I sometimes get messages on my email account that are very interesting. There's one professor who's having their students watch Matters Microbial as part of their microbiology course, and I am so flattered. Also, I am often asked about particular references or topics we discuss on the podcast. Please remember the show notes where I do my best to provide relevant and interesting links. And as always, Thank you all for listening and or watching. We've talked before on this podcast about how numerous and prevalent microbes are in and on humans, and this is nowhere more true than the human gut. Enormous numbers of microbes pass through or live within our gut, estimated to be more than 10 to the 12th, and the gut epithelium and its extracellular matrix scaffolding act as an interactive and protective border. Some microbes in our gut are necessary, others possibly negative, and many are, well, just passing through. So that epithelial border is very important and often passes signals to and from the immune system. When that border begins to break down, serious diseases like irritable bowel syndrome or worse can result. But how to study the role of gut microbes and that border? So it's a real pleasure to invite Dr. Ana Maria Porras of the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Florida to the Quality Quorum today to discuss the work of her laboratory group in this area, as well as her efforts to increase representation in the biological sciences, the interface between biology and engineering, and creative outreach activities. Welcome to our Quality Quorum, Ana. Hi, Mark. I'm so happy to be here at the Quality Quorum. I'm honored to get this invitation. (laughs) Well, I have been following you on Twitter for a very long time. And the first thing that I want to say is you're part of a biological engineering area. Can you talk a little bit with that? Because so many of us are just to use streaking plates. 
Yeah, so I'm a biomedical engineer. I am not. A lot of people think I'm a microbiologist by training. I am not. And so a lot of my training was in learning how to harness the natural materials that our body already makes. So things that you have already heard of, like, for example, collagen or gelatin, things that are normally present in our bodies. How can we use those to recreate tissues in the laboratory so that instead of us having to go to an animal model or just like grow things on plastic, which doesn't resemble the properties of our human body, instead we can use these other materials to create something that's a little bit closer to what actual humans are like. I think that that's really interesting. And I should point out to everyone that you were recently awarded, and I will put a link up to this, an NSF career award for this area. And I think you can hear us all microbially applauding you for this. It is such an honor, is it not? Yes, it's a huge honor. And what excites me the most is that. So that work is not related to the microbiome. It's related to a tropical parasite that is relevant in Colombia, where I am from. And like, I have been dreaming of doing things like that, like merging my engineering with the tropical parasites that impact people where I come from for years. So that I think that was the most exciting part is that. And then, of course, later today, we'll talk more about my work with crochet microbes. And it also includes that. So I feel like it just encompasses a lot of things that I'm really passionate about. And so I'm very grateful to the National Science Foundation for the award. I'm going to put a, a link up to the announcement that your institution made, because that must Thank be you. a good feeling to see. So I, I, I think the first thing to say is that, am, am I not correct that your parents are engineers? Yeah, that's true. My parents are engineers. Kind of my case is a little bit unique because both my parents are engineers, mm -hmm. kind of in more traditional disciplines like civil engineering and in computer mm -hmm. engineering. And they're both professors too, which is a little wow. bit abnormal that normally, you know, <laughs> you know, most people's parents are not professors. I always joke that, um, and they live in Colombia. They are my mom is now retired, but they were professors in Colombia. And when I moved to the U.S., that's like, because right, if you think about it, if your parents are professors and their friends are professors, and also the fact that in Spanish, professor and teacher are the same word, right? We don't have this like level of prestige associated with just the word of like you teach at a university. For me, it was like, a, I thought it was like a super normal occupation. And then I came to the U.S. for college, and I was like, oh, wait, like a small percentage of people become professors. That was new to me. And it's still weird to me that sometimes we're treated like a little bit differently or more prestigiously for being professors when in my mind, I'm like, it's just another occupation that is just as useful to society as some other occupation. So I, I that you're really making me happy because my late mother was so funny about this. I mean, she didn't go to college. She didn't understand anything that I did. She would not call me a professor because she felt that that was arrogant. This is what she <laughs> said to me. She says, what you are is a teacher. And I'll take it. I, I yeah. finally got her to say educator at one point. Okay. So I, I made some progress. The other <laughs> thing that I think will amuse you is that she was asking me about some stuff on campus taking place. And she turns and looks at me and she said, I thought professors were smart. And then I said, professors are like anybody else. They're, you know, they, they have all the different foibles and positives and negatives of any other profession. A hundred percent. We're just regular people who have more degrees. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. So, but how wonderful that you had that kind of background. I will say that my own children, neither one were interested in the biological sciences I blame myself, but one of my sons is very interested in mathematics. My wife oh. is a mathematician, and she's so excited and basically teases me about it often. Yeah, it's so there you, you know, go. and it's so funny because I think now my parents are really proud of me. They're the first to share accomplishments. I think it's fun for them too because um, they get to learn about what it's like. Like we get to compare notes all the time. And in what the system is like here in the U.S. versus in Colombia. And it, that part is interesting. But I think when I first said I wanted to be a professor, I'm not sure if my parents were super thrilled because, you know, they know how hard professors have to work, all the different jobs that you have to do. And I don't know that they were necessarily like my parents. I remember my dad specifically was like, are you sure? Like, 
with an engineering degree in the U.S., you could probably, you know, like make a lot more money faster <laughs> doing something different and just as interesting, you know. But for me, I think, especially for my mom, I specifically inherited my love for teaching. So like teaching, it really genuinely is my favorite part of the job, more so than the research and I think what I enjoy about the research is that we get to teach other people um, how to do research and how to learn things. But if I had to do all the research myself, I don't enjoy that as much. So like I wouldn't, if I were doing something else, you would not find me in a company at an R&D department because that's just not the part of this that I enjoy the most. There is nothing to compare the feeling when a student gets it or when they do an experiment that you're teaching them to do or a research ex expectation they didn't have. It is so wonderful for me. And it kind of uh, makes the downsides more, more, more acceptable. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> Very true. So I want to move on to today's topic with you, if that's okay. And yes. I want to remind everybody, a lot of folks talk about the microbiome. We've had several episodes about it. This huge number of microbes, and I, I guess I was trying to be punny when I talked about passing through, but these are huge numbers of microbes, some of which have co-evolved with us, some of which, again, are just transients, for lack of a better term, some of which can cause issues. I don't know if you're in the school of uh, Arturo Casa Duval, that we have to be careful about the word pathogen. It's really more contextual. Uh, and I think that that's, that's true. Um, but it's interesting to think about that huge number. We, we know that we have three layers of microbes on our skin, but inside our gut, we have this enormous quantity and we have this thin barrier. And so what I'd like you to do, if you would, for a moment, is talk a little bit about this barrier of epithelial cells and the scaffolding made of the extracellular matrix around it. Yeah, totally. So as you were saying, Mark, we have a ton of bacteria in our guts. Um, I agree with this idea that a lot of the things that we think of as either commensal, meaning good for you, or pathogenic. I think once we finish talking about this today, I hope the audience will also get a sense for how so much of this depends on the context and that like a lot of the bacteria that we think of as good for us maybe are good under some circumstances and then other things happen in your body and then they become bad. And I also don't like even saying the words good or bad because it's not like bacteria are people that have goals to make you feel good or bad. They're just trying to survive, same as us, right? They're just trying to get food. They're and then the environment kind of dictates what they do or don't do. But anyways, going back to what you were saying, let's start with what's the gut environment like for a healthy person. So like for a healthy person, if you imagine, right, that like your gut, let's say we take a cross section of the colon, for example, and it's like a tube, right? So a tube, that tube, same as, for example, in our nose, in our trachea, every surface that is exposed to the outside world would have a lining of mucus, right? And you, the audience has a pretty good sense for how the amount of mucus can change because we experience that, for example, when we get a cold and sometimes we produce more mucus <laughs> that, you know, reveals itself in interesting ways. But that mucus, what it does is also provide kind of a barrier between the microbes that are in your gut and the tissue that's underneath. So that's one part of the barrier. Um, that mucus consists of sugar-like molecules, primarily mucin. And then underneath that, we have the epithelium, which is this single monolayer of cells that are like, it's almost like if you imagine a wall made of stone, that is like really where the stones are like really stuck really well one to the other. So almost like a medieval city that would be really hard to invade, right? Because then those connections between those stones or cells are really, really tight. And again, even if you don't have a muc like a mucus, that in theory should protect you from bacteria or either the bacteria that normally live with us or a pathogen, like for example, you ate a piece of lettuce that was contaminated with a bad strain of E. coli, for example. 
Um, and then even more, we have another layer of protection right underneath the epithelium. We That's where we start to see our human tissues um, and things like the extracellular matrix. So we often think of a tissue as consisting primarily of cells. So we think of bone, oh, bone is cells, like bone cells, and that's it. And in reality, most of our tissues, yes, the cells are a component, but most of the tissue and what gives the tissue the mechanical properties that it has is the extracellular matrix, which is all the stuff that's outside of the cell. So the way I like to think about it is imagine you have chocolate chips. Your cells are like chocolate chips or sprinkles. Sprinkles are chocolate chips, right? And then the extracellular matrix is the dough. So all the stuff that's around it. And based on, right, based on the properties of that dough, you could have a cookie or a biscotti or a pan au chocolat or a jello with sprinkles. So it's that extracellular matrix is actually what makes the tissue soft or stiff. So you can imagine that based on that analogy, that it plays a really important role on how that tissue functions. And so that's in the case of a healthy person, we kind of have all these different barriers. In the case of a disease type situation, for example, you mentioned like a person who has maybe um, inflammatory bowel syndrome or IBS. In those cases, or a person who has colorectal cancer, it's likely that that person wouldn't be able to produce as much mucus. Therefore, it's more likely that now your bacteria are closer to those epithelial cells. And then either the bacteria themselves or other things happening in your body could make it so that those stones or the epithelial cells are no longer attached as close to each other as they should be. And so that makes it more leaky or allows more things to pass through. And then that means that now either the bacteria themselves or the products that the bacteria make now have access to the tissue that is, sits underneath, including components of the extracellular matrix. Like I said, the dough that provides all this important support for your tissues. And so it's kind of a lot of different things that can happen in a disease context. It's really interesting too, because you, you know, when I was teaching about the extracellular matrix, because students, as you say, often think of tissues just composed of cells, just like uh, your fence idea. But there's that whole matrix that they're in and names of compounds that we keep reading about when we read interesting scientific papers like fibronectin, different forms of collagen, um, all of these things are really, really relevant. Proteoglycans, glycoproteins, all the rest. It's so complicated. And by the way, for the listeners and viewers, carbohydrate biochemistry is very difficult. No so, I mean, under, yes, understanding all of this is, is really, really difficult. So this barrier that helps protect the gut, I want to be very clear. And, and, and Anna, I don't know if you've heard my shtick about this. But many times people think that all bacteria are bad. Those are devil microbes. All bacteria are good. That's Those are angel microbes. But the fact is, most microbes could care less. So I call them okay. meh microbes. So the fact is, we have all these things together in our gut. And then we're bringing in new things and they're leaving and all of this stuff. It's just a constant flow. So what happens when there's any kind of of damage or, and it can be endogenously formed. Well, I hope that we can talk about inflammation. And you mentioned yeah. IBS and there are similar types of disorders that are quite serious. And many of them have to do with the breakdown of that barrier. Would you say that that's fair? Yeah, that's totally yeah. fair. And that, so like in kind of the more traditional way of thinking about it, the thought is something triggers inflammation. It For some patients, it could be genetic. Um, for others, it could be stress, right? Sometimes, for example, people with inflammatory bowel disease or IBS have flare-ups because of stress, and that can be related to imbalances in your immune system that trigger inflammation. And what we mean by trigger inflammation is that, that what's happening is a cascade of events. That means that the cells in your immune system are releasing a lot of molecules that are signaling to other cells in your body, hey, warning, I'm really stressed, um, I need you to do something. <laughs> and then sometimes what can happen is that those triggers, for example, can cause 
the cells responsible for secreting mucin, for example, to secrete less mucin, right, for example. Or for some reason, those cells are apoptosing or dying, and therefore you now no longer have as much mucin. So now the bacteria are closer to your tissues when they are not supposed to be closer to your tissues. Another thing that can happen is, for example, those connections between the epithelial cells can be degraded or maybe not as strong anymore. And so, again, then we have that disruption of that epithelium. So a lot of the traditional thinking of what happens in this case has been more from the perspective of it's really mostly what's happening in the host or in the human that is driving that degradation of that barrier, right? The hypothesis that I had when I was a postdoc that we continue to explore in the lab is that, hey, maybe, especially since, like I said, if we don't have as much mucin and now the bacteria are closer to the tissue that then they are supposed to be, maybe those bacteria also play a role in degrading that mucosal barrier. Maybe they secrete enzymes um, that, sorry, not just a mucosal barrier, but that secrete enzymes that can degrade components of that epithelium, that can degrade the extracellular matrix that supports that epithelium. And maybe it's also the bacteria that play themselves that play a role in making the gut experience this breakdown of the intestinal barrier. You know, I, I, I had, and this happens to me, you'll have to forgive me, you'll say something and like a little light goes off in my head that I remember something. And I remember hearing that one member of the gut community, and it's, and I know when I say bacteroides and they're changing the name, you saw that, didn't you? I did not oh see my. that. Oh my God. Oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for responding that way. Uh, it's, it's happened, no, it happened I, to me in I grad school say, too. I, yeah. I have to say that as an engineer, like as a non-microbiologist, I find it so hard to keep up with the names of different species. I'm like, I, you know, I like barely, I just barely learned all the ones that I, are most relevant for my work, and now I have to learn new names. <laughs> and, and, and I want to be clear, just in case, you know, there are haters on, on what I just said. Right. You know, let, uh, haters got to hate, but don't let them dictate. So here's what I want to say, is that sometimes there are good reasons to change the designations. I'm simply expressing my frustration at not being able to keep up. That's all. Exactly, exactly, exactly. They, We're not saying that it's not necessary. We're just saying it's a little bit hard to keep up. <laughs> and and they did that to me with the organism that I studied in graduate school. So, you know, I, no. I, I have a sensitivity in this area. Getting yeah. back to my point, I remember reading that one type of the Bacteroides, I hate saying the word species because that's that's another minefield, isn't it? But it apparently induces the production of more mucus. And so what I've told people, because they have a particular metabolic pathway where they can use the sugar acids that are part of mucus. So I've often told students that they're mucus farmers. They're farming us for mucus. <laughs> and the reason that I bring this up is this two-directional thing. It's mm -hmm. easy to think of what passes through your gut as just passing through, and maybe some of them can uh, go through breaks or invade, whatever you want to call it, but there's a lot of back and forth going on, which is fascinating to me. D did I get that right? Yeah, I think I you totally got that right, because it's definitely bidirectional, right? If you think about it, it's also dictated by what we eat, because what we eat is exactly like you said, feeds the metabolism of different bacteria over others. Then you also, there is also some evidence, I'm blanking on the exact bacteria right now, but there are some bacteria that secrete uh, metabolites and other components that will cause an increase in mucus production. And then a, yeah. a yet another type of bacteria like Akkermansia of some of these bacteroides species that are mucus degraders will then, right? Because it's also not, that these bacteria are also not present in our gut in isolation. They're, and and I, and I fully acknowledge that I'm also saying these in the context that the paper we're going to talk about, all the experiments were done with the bacteria in isolation. So we oversimplify sometimes. But in the real human body, you have synergies into like one bacteria that stays, which then feeds another type of bacteria and it can create mutualistic relationships sometimes, other times competitive relationships between different types of bacteria. So 
Like, I, I hope what the listener gets, especially if it's somebody who's interested in the microbiome from more of like their own health type perspective, is that often when we look at the news or we look at what I see on social media, especially people trying to sell you products to quote unquote fix your microbiome, is that if you were to listen to those people, you would think we would know everything about the gut microbiome. When like those of us who are in the trenches trying to do microbiome research, you're like, I cannot like the complexity of these is uh, a little bit overwhelming and it's kind of hard to identify those cause and effect relationships because everything is so complex. So we know a lot more now than we did 25 years ago, but that's still like the tip of the iceberg compared to us truly understanding what's happening. We, all of us, I mean, I, I, I had students that make fun of when I would, I, I, I'm, I'm often flippant, you know this. And I would say things like students are Petri dishes with shoes. And and that's not really true. What we all are, all of us actually are, are walking series of ecologies. And that level of complexity, I'm not being negative about people who study things in isolation. That's how we begin to learn. But as you just said, it's so important to remember the interplay of all the different it organisms. And so that brings us to the paper that I I was so I so enjoyed and I was so impressed by, and I'm going to make sure that there's access because it's an open access paper in the show notes. The title is as as I really like I, I really like it, inflammatory inflammatory bowel disease associated gut commensals degrade components of the extracellular mm -hmm. matrix, and what you're doing is you're talking about exactly what we led up to here, and. The first thing that you want to probably tell everyone is why you got interested in this, and then we can start to talk about how you studied it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I said, I started this work at, uh, when I was a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell University, and that group, in that group, um, we studied, the thing I was working on prior to this was differences, which is a whole other rabbit hole we can go on and some other time, is how uh, differences in the composition of the microbiome between populations in different parts of the world, how that impacts susceptibility to infection and the way we interpret microbiome studies. And I'm not going to go further into that because you could probably get me ranting for three hours on the importance of global in inclusion for microbiome research and the way we interpret our results. But that's like a topic for another day. Um, so I was studying that other people in the lab were studying antimicrobial resistance. Other people were trying to do kind of gene editing of strains present in the microbiome. And for a little bit, I was working on one of those projects. And we were trying to figure out how to get one of these bacteria species. And just in case you all are not aware, um, these type of bacteria, bacteroides, are really abundant in the guts of people all around the world, and especially in the guts of people in the global north. So in places like the United States and in Europe, like really, really abundant. They can make up a quite significant proportion of the bacteria that we find in a, in a person's gut. And so I remember we were trying to edit this gene out. We were trying to knock it down, meaning reduce the, the levels that it expresses. And this gene was capable of degrading mucin, and it was capable of degrading a component called chondroitin sulfate. So that's a type of glycosaminoglycan or sugar type molecule. And I was like kind of doing the experiments for a while. And then one random day I was like working and then I was like, wait a minute, this chondroitin sulfate, I did my PhD on this, right? Like it's not just some random substrate for this enzyme. It's also a component that's found in the human extracellular matrix. I had studied it in the context of the aortic valve. It's also really abundant in the knee, in a lot of different tissues. And that actually was kind of a light bulb moment because I was like, I hadn't, right, like I said, my PhD training, like I said at the very beginning, was so different from the microbiome stuff I had been working on. And I hadn't yet thought of how am I going to merge these two, right? If I want to be a faculty member, how am I merging these two very different things? And so then I like was that kind of sat with me for maybe like a month or two where I was like, okay, how do I put these two things to get, yes, this is a component I have seen. And then that sent me in this rabbit hole of like, oh, do other bacteria degrade other things that are present in human tissues, like in the extracellular matrix? What, right? So I literally just started Googling or going on PubMed and being like, 
gut microbiome collagen, gut microbiome uh, laminin degradation, gut microbiome hyaluronic acid degradation. So all the different components that we see in human extracellular matrix. And what I ended up finding is that we didn't have a ton of information on this with the exception of maybe collagen. Like there are bacteria that are present in the gut that have been reported in labs that they can degrade collagen. Um, but people usually make this as kind of a more general observation on the proteolytic or the ability of bacteria to degrade human proteins, but not necessarily from the point of view of like, hey, these are components of the extracellular matrix. What does that mean for the integrity of that tissue? I found that we know a ton about how pathogens in the gut, in the lung, in other organs that have microbiomes, how pathogens harness the extracellular matrix to be able to invade deeper into tissues, to be able to like successfully colonize uh, parts of our bodies, but not as much in commensal microbes. And so that that's mm -hmm. really what sent me in this rabbit hole. So like the first question was super simple. Like, is this possible? Since it's not as well reported in the literature. So like step one is like, can this happen, even if it's in a very artificial environment? No, this is very interesting on, on a couple of levels. And the first thing that I want to say to the listeners and viewers is that the majority of microbes that live within the gut, oh, I should be careful when I say this, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong, do not care for oxygen at all. And in fact, they are obligately anaerobic. And this is very different than the way, for example, that I study bacteria on plates. In fact, and we'll put a picture of this up, you have to use an anaerobic chamber. And this and in this anaerobic chamber, you have to find ways to manipulate and do all the work that we do with the microbes in the absence of oxygen. And this is an example of something that when people first start thinking about the microbe, they, microbiome, they don't consider. Most yeah. people would tell me that E. coli is the most common organism in the gut. It's not true, of course. And I, I was fortunate enough to do some some work on on that a little bit when when I was much younger. But the important news here is that you're able to actually study these things. Again, what was fascinating about your work, in my opinion, is you're able to tease out effects and start to make conclusions about what organisms have what effect. But before we get there, there's a word in your paper that I would like you to explain, if you don't mind. You talk of about course. remodeling. Yes. So. My my wife loves real estate. For her, remodeling means something very different. What do you mean? Yeah, so what we mean by remodeling in the extracellular matrix literature is there is, if you really uh, pare it down, right? So the extracellular matrix is constantly in a process of renewal. So it's not like it's static. It's not like your cells make it and then the extracellular, I mean, that's the way it is until you die. The reality is that this is a very active process. So you can have degradation of extracellular matrix, meaning breakdown of that extracellular matrix. And that would be similar to what we were discussing a few minutes ago on like breakdown of that intestinal barrier and increased permeability, but you can also have extracellular matrix production. Sometimes people call that deposition, which means we have excess extracellular matrix that is produced because, and this doesn't have to be related to disease necessarily, right? So for example, if there's in the, in the, in the intestines, for example, in the regular transit of food, if for some reason, a part of your tissue is slightly damaged, well, the cells in the in that tissue responsible for making extracellular matrix might make more ECM to repair that damage, and then that's it, and then it's done. In a disease context, you can have excessive extracellular matrix production, right? So remodeling just refers to those two things combined. So when we use the word remodeling, we mean it could either be degradation or production. We don't know which, um, but it, it just means the extracellular matrix is being modified. I and, and in my reading, it was as you exactly as you say, it, it, what I got out of it is just the amount of transit of so many microbes. There are all these different aspects. There's physical damage from things moving through there that needs to be repaired. There are interactions that are taking place. We're complicated. And, very complicated. And, and, I found, and I found this so fascinating. So what I like very much in your paper, at least in figure one, is the business where you're testing individual microbes 
for their ability to actually break down different components you might find in the ECM? Yes, yes. Can, so like can, I was... Uh -huh. No, go ahead. I was going to yeah. say, can, 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 can you tell me a little bit of how you might do that with an example? Because I want to emphasize to listeners and viewers, there are two ways to go about things in vitro and in vivo. And then to an engineer, what do you call that room in between? Because I know you do that too. Yes, 100%. Okay, so... Like I said, the right, I became obsessed with this idea of, hey, do God, members of the God microbiome interact and degrade or remodel human extracellular matrix? And so the first, when you're talking, for example, clinicians, the first thing they want to know is, how do you know this happens in the human body? And I was like, well, we're not even there yet. I first want to know, can this happen, period? Like, is this even worth spending my time on right because as a scientist that's also kind of the way you think you're like i have this kind of a small hypothesis i don't know if there's enough there to invest like years of my life or now in my case like bet my whole lab on it basically right so like what experiments this is how like how an engineer thinks it's like what experiments can I do as quickly as possible that are going to give me as much information as possible to know if I should go forward with this experiment and if I should pursue this hypothesis, right? So what I wanted to do is, let's say if I have a bacteria, I wanted to come up with an assay or like a way to test their ability to degrade extracellular matrix. That was one, something that I could do so this is talking a little bit like an engineer, like our design criteria for the assay. So something that would be fast because I wanted to test more than one bacteria. And so it, if I wanted to test 12 at a time, it needed to be something that could be fast that I could read in a plate reader, because if you can read in a plate reader, then that means that's again, fast, efficient. I'm not going to have to count stuff by hand. If, possible that it was at least semi-quantitative, meaning that I could at the very least make conclusions and draw, like perform statistics. If it was something that I wanted to read it on a plate reader, then it also meant I had to find assays that use, for example, fluorescence. So I could measure amount of fluorescence or absorbance. I could measure a change in color. Those were, and then like you said, there was a lot of back and forth on when we wanted to conduct this test aerobically or anaerobically, because you could have good arguments for both. Do you want? Do we want to conduct a test in the environment where the bacteria would be happy, anaerobic, or if you think about it, the tissue, which is where the ECM is, it's going to be in an aerobic environment. So then, how do we do that? So what we ended up landing at is we would grow each strain, each bacteria, and we'll go in, in a little bit into how I selected which bacteria to test. But we would grow each strain of bacteria, and then uh, we would collect the supernatant. And part of the reason we did it with the supernatant and not with the bacteria itself is because we did have the kind of the clinician in the back of our hands being like, yeah, but bacterial translocation is less common, like, how do you know that the bacteria make it to the extracellular matrix? And we're like, well, that's true. We need a lot more data to prove that that happens. What is more likely to happen is that something secreted by the bacteria would be able to cross that epithelial barrier and maybe have access to the underlying museum. So we did the supernatant. And then, like I said, I'll just give you one example from the assays we use with a protein that a lot of people are very familiar with, collagen. Right, We hear about collagen all the time, collagen in our skin, keeping our skin young and healthy. Some people even take, which we can chat about later, like some people even take collagen supplements. And yes, exactly, et cetera. Um, even we don't realize it, but when, and sometimes I say this and then don't realize that people might be like, ew, but jello is gelatin, which is degraded collagen just so people are aware of it right so for example with the collagen we you know i did a search and i found this really cool reagent that i could order so if it was readily available even better right because that helped with the quick efficient assay and so we found a reagent called dq collagen and dq just refers to a fluorophores that are attached to the collagen molecule and so when the collagen molecule is intact it has so many of those fluorophores that they quench each other, meaning there is no fluorescent signal. And then if there is something in the in the like stuff that the bacteria produce 
that can cut those that collagen into smaller pieces, then those smaller pieces will have only one or two fluorophores and they will fluoresce. So by measuring the amount of fluorescence, I can now say, oh, this one has more fluorescence, therefore it degraded collagen more or less. And with the same similar assays, not identical, but similar assays, some others where instead of it being a fluorescence measurement, it could be, for example, in the case of the other molecule I mentioned, chondroitin sulfate, um, we had a reagent, Alcyon Blue, that binds to chondroitin sulfate. And then when it binds, mm -hmm. that Alcyon Blue is, like I said, blue. So if we have more blue, um, then I guess in this case, if we had less blue, it meant that chondroitin sulfate was degraded. So by we turned something that was a little bit more complex into something relatively simple, fluorescence or color changes. And we could measure that quickly with a plate reader, allowing us to assay for like a wider range of bacteria in the same amount of right. time. Right. And, and, and this is a wonderful, a wonderful explanation of how you're going to do this. Now, again, it's important for the reader, the reader, the listener and the viewer to know that a lot of times we have to look at things one at a time to understand the overall contours of the work. So what you're doing is using culture supernatants and you're seeing whether or not they have this kind of effect. And, okay. and I think that that's what you're shown in figure one. And I notice a large number of different strains, taxa of bacteria that you were using. How did you choose the ones you wanted to yeah, use? That's a, that's a fantastic question. We spent a lot of time thinking about that too. So we had kind of several different categories of reasons why we included them. So some of them, we chose them because they're very abundant in the guts of human beings. So for example, our right. bacteroidae species, um, which I think in the paper are in shades of green or teal, if I'm remembering correctly. And um, so we have those. We also, for example, had Prevotella species that I think are like P. copri in, that, in the caption for that figure. Those we chose because they're abundant, but in the guts, we wanted to make sure because of my other work that we were not only choosing bacterial strains that were only abundant in the guts of people uh, in the global north, but that we were also capturing a little bit, not all, but at least some of the global diversity of the microbiome. Um, sure. We also uh, included bacteria that we knew were mucin degraders because we knew, hey, mucin is not super different from some of the extracellular matrix components. So maybe if they can degrade mucin, they can degrade other things. So for example, Acromasia mucinifila is um, also present in that bacteria. And just so people also understand the way we abbreviate the bacteria, it's like the first word that I'm saying, Acromasia mucinifila would get abbreviated to just an A. So it'd be like A mucinifila. And that is what that means. Or like Bacteroides ovatus, it would be B ovatus. Um, and so we chose it that way. And sometimes there was overlap, right? So for example, Bacteroides theta, iota, omicron, or B theta, that can, is abundant and can also degrade mucin, right? And then we also chose some bacteria like Ruminococcus navis that we knew from the literature was associated with inflammatory bowel disease. So we knew mm. this was a bacteria that was already hypothesized to play more of a pathogenic or quote unquote bad role. And then lastly, and this is really important for anybody planning experiments, you always have to think of your controls. So what do you think is going to be your negative control, meaning like you're, you hypothesize you're maybe not going to see as much, in this case, degradation of extracellular matrix. And so for that, we chose some of the most commonly used pro, quote unquote probiotics. So that's why we have some lactobacillus in there and some bifidobacteria in there that I think are more towards the left of that graph. And it was kind of cool because we didn't know, right? Just because they're probiotic and reported in the literature as probiotic, we had no idea if that also meant they were not going to degrade extracellular matrix. We didn't know. We There were no reports in the literature. And it was kind of cool to see that those bacteria that I think are in the yellow, um, those bacteria didn't didn't degrade yeah. extracellular matrix components, which I think in itself is fascinating, right? And like these strains that yeah. we think of as probiotic don't do it. Um, and also the in that graph, in figure one, the closer the bacteria are to each other, 
It's just the more closely related they are to each other genetically, just to just the way we organize them on the chart. Sure. And if they're from the same color, that means they belong to the same genus, meaning they're all lactobacilli or they're all bacteroides or they're Prevotella. I think it's a lovely a diagram to look at. And, and again, the thing that's important for people to look at are the differences. You see things that were um, fibronectin is being broken down differently than collagen one, uh, different than laminin, different than hyaluron, <laughs> a chondroitin sulfate, and so on. I mean, it's, it's a really nice explanation of how science is done. But then what I notice, you get to part G of figure one, and there you're looking about at permeability. And that is because you're interested in this disease state where you're actually the effectors of inflammation, of problems, how they get through the tissues. Yes? Yes. So exactly. In part, the first few parts, right? We were, like we were talking about, we we're kind of overly simplifying. So we had these testing these bacteria and then we would do one component at a time collagen at a time hyaluronic acid at a time that's another component that people are really familiar with because it's often found in like skincare products for example um, right we were doing them one at a time and most of them really in solution and in reality like in your tissues they're not in solution they form gel so jello like materials right mm -hmm. so yeah. that last figure figure g was our attempt at starting which is what we're doing in my lab now but even more is like can we sort of build more of that complexity so rather than having one of the things at a time we use a material called matrigel and matrigel is actually isolated from cancer cells that produce the same type of extracellular matrix that we would find underneath epithelial cells. So it includes a mixture of some of the other components that we had done individual assays for, including collagen 4, laminin, maybe a little bit of fibronectin. So, and, and instead of doing it in solution, what we would do is we would make a thin gel first on a trans well, meaning like it sits on top of a membrane that does allow the flow of materials from the top to the bottom of the well. So we would make that first, and then we would pre treat our samples with, um, sorry, treat the gels, kind of the like epithet, the is extracellular matrix membrane mimic, treat those with the supernatant from our bacteria. And then we would also, this part is kind of fun. We also added a fluorescent dye. And so then by measuring how much of that fluorescent dye made it past that gel plus membrane, we are doing like a proxy, um, obviously overly simplified, but it's a proxy for, like you said, intestinal permeability. This is really well done because this really takes you to the interface in essence of how an engineer would look at things and a microbiologist would look at things. And I have to keep coming back as I have in this podcast. Sometimes we become too narrow as scientists. Yes. And I really think that when we like, just like I have a better view of things with two eyes than one, it's the same idea in science. And we get too siloed for lack of a better term. I find this in terms of representation. I find this in terms of the way that we look at science. You already mentioned this idea of looking at the global microbiome rather than just looking at, say, um, the northern or the western microbiome. It's it's something that is so important. And, and look at the fun things here. And what I like about what you've done here today is you've really explained how you went about some of the work. Yes, thank you. And I want to echo what you were just saying, like, so often I encounter, there's a lot of engineers working on, for example, organoids of the gut. And because we're so host-centric, we right, are in biomedical engineering, all of our classes are on humans. I didn't have to take any microbiology classes. For example, a lot of that organoid work doesn't give you access to the lumen, meaning the center of the cross-section. Mm -hmm. So there, how are you going to test interactions with microbes if you cannot access them? 
right? And then same on, like you were saying, some on the other side with the microbiologists, a lot of people are so microbe focused that you don't think about what are the other components of the tissue or immunologists are all about the immune system and they don't consider, and not to say that I have the perfect solutions. If anything, it's kind of harder to work at this intersection because all the time you feel like I'm not an expert at anything. <laughs> like, you know, you're just like, know a little bit about everything and you're just kind of trying to piece it all together. But I do think that at the very least, you can bring in a different perspective and um, and I think that's that has been really gratifying because, for example, the microbiome field is really crowded. There's a ton of people doing work on the microbiome, which I find I find it really terrifying to work on a field that's this crowded. But one thing that I find comforting is that there's really not that many people looking at one. There's not that many people looking at gut ECM, period. And then fewer people looking at interactions between the microbes and the EC and the host extracellular matrix. And so it's kind of fun to be able to build your own little niche. And I mean, it does mean sometimes you have to do a lot more work to convince people that what you're studying can happen. Um, but it also means there's the other thing I find gratifying is that a lot of people ask me follow up questions when I give seminars and I'm like, that's a grant I just wrote. That's what my other student is studying. Like this, there just are so many questions that we don't know about, and that makes the science more exciting. Uh, I couldn't agree more. This is so wonderful to hear. Uh, I I often worry that we get too narrow, and okay. and this is a nice solution to it. To come at things for different uh, different areas. I, I I'll put a link to the paper in the show notes simply because it's a fun paper to read. I really like the explanations that you've made and we could continue to talk about that paper forever, but I think we've done a good job explaining to the listeners and viewers, how you go about showing that these microbes can actually tend to interact with the ECM. And it, to me, it's, it's a fascinating subject. So as, as we discuss your paper, Anna, which I've really enjoyed talking about, can you think of some practical applications, say, for the treatment of IBS that you can envision coming from it? Yeah, so we are, right, this paper is the very first step, but let's say in a, right, in a future where everything goes great. I think, well, one, the first question, which is the first question we are trying to answer in the lab, is... What is it that drives the microbes to degrade more or less extracellular matrix? Because if we could figure it out, maybe we could develop a preventative strategy, like if it's a particular type of food or something, right? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Two, if it is true that, it, going back to the clinician question, if it is true that gut microbes in vivo, in the actual human, can degrade human extracellular matrix, which we have not, right, the work in that paper is not enough to prove that that's true. But if it mm -hmm. is true, what are the consequences for the host cells? Because that extracellular matrix provides a lot of cues to the host cells. And if we understand what those consequences are and identify the specific mechanisms, could we maybe treat patients with inhibitors that stop them from degrading the extracellular matrix? Those first two are kind of harder, honestly, harder bars to clear. I think a third one that is kind of, you know, percolating in the back of my mind, another finding from the paper is that we saw that for patients that have ulcerative colitis, if we culture their microbiome and took the supernatant, it exhibited higher degrees of extracellular matrix degradation than the control samples. So could we maybe in the future develop some sort of screening assay? Is there a difference between, for example, uh, a pre-flare-up versus a post-flare-up? Could we take a microbiome sample, which really just means a stool sample from a patient, and run degradation assays and be able to predict anything about what's going to happen next to the patient? Because if so, then maybe we could help develop improved diagnostic tests, right? So those are kind of the kinds of questions you can think about big picture. I think we still have a lot of questions to answer before that, but that those are some of the implications it could maybe have in the future. I have my own thoughts about this, but I wanted to know what you think of this, Anna. So why is it, have these microbes evolved the ability to break down ECM components? Is it essentially dietary for the microbes? <laughs> 
So that's a fantastic question. And one that I have to admit as a biomedical engineer, I often do not think this way. So it's usually when other people ask me questions that I'm like, oh, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> and we should pursue it. And one of my students is um, pursue, will be pursuing that in the next few years during her PhD. We're trying to understand, do these microbes use, for example, these proteins and, and uh, glycosaminoglycans as carbon sources, meaning as their food? Right. And if so, under what circumstances? Right. Is it when they're in a particular type of environmental condition? We also want to start growing them not in isolation, but maybe in pairs or communities. Is it an unintended consequence of metabolizing something else? Or is it more than like, sure, maybe one microbe degrades this proteins and doesn't use it as a carbon source, but a different microbe could use it as a carbon source. So those are also the kinds of questions we are interested in answering, because right now the truth is we don't know yet. Two things to, to tell you is that a uh, colleague of mine at Wisconsin-Madison, Joe Handelsman's group, had found years ago that there are some types of bacteria that live within the peptidoglycan layer of another right. bacterium. And they're breaking down that peptidoglycan, and they're okay. using those components for growth, which is what made me think of this. That is so interesting. So that's right. And 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 the second thing, and this is very far afield, and I it may not apply, but every time I I I tend to think about group behaviors from yeah. microbes, quorum sensing. So the idea is, are they only doing this at high concentrations of the bacteria, or is it just they're just naturally doing this? This is a fantastic question, because the way we grow them is when there's high concentrations of the bacteria. You just gave me a thought. Well, that's great. Yep. Writing it down. <laughs> I have another one, and again, this may be far afield. Uh, you mentioned a lot of probiotics uh, organisms, probiotic-associated microbes that you tested for ability to break down ECM or not, or not the ability to do that. And that got me thinking a little bit about probiotics that one buys. There's a whole industry about this, and I have questions about that. But you'll notice that when you purchase these organisms, there's generally a select number that they include yet. When genomic analysis, metagenomic analysis is done of the, of the human gut, you find many, many more relatives of probiotic organisms there. So is there a rationale for the ones that they select, or is it just the ones that they can cultivate? I think it's probably more of the latter. Like what, hmm. as you said, a lot of the microorganisms in our gut are anaerobic. And I think that poses a really big challenge for the manufacturing and more at a bigger scale of probiotics. Because one, you have to be able to grow them at these large scales in anaerobic settings. They have to be, you have to be able to grow them. And some of the bacteria, for example, Prevotella, harder to grow than bacteroides, just as a starting point. Um, and also then, also shelf stability, like, right, if they're anaerobic and all of these things, and then will they be alive? Um, I think that's right. And then at some point, there has to be something associated with the cost of producing them in order to sell them at, a, at I imagine, a level where they can make a profit. But then the other truth is, which I tell, right, I have friends that ask me all the time, should I consume probiotics? I personally don't consume probiotics. I think it's more important to have a healthy diet, right, and feed mm -hmm. your food kind of good prebiotics, so things that will help your good gut microbes grow. Um, because the other outstanding question, and I think this is especially true in the context of the conversation we have pending on diversity in gut microbiome research, is that like the reality is that we don't really know what makes a microbiome healthy. And so like, I don't know that those 40 species that are there, do I really need those? Will, I just had a visiting student from Colombia, Kat Bauer, uh, she was presenting today in my lab meeting and she said something really true. Like a lot of people take probiotics, for example, like acromancia. But what if your gut lining is already very thin and acromancia is a mucin degrader? Like, do you, maybe you think you're consuming a probiotic and you might inadvertently making it the problem 
worse and not better. So I just think we're not quite at that level yet where we can know what kinds of probiotics are going to be great for what people. What I'd like to spend a few minutes with is a very interesting form of outreach that you do. And, and I want to say that, as I said before, many people view microbes as negative things. You found a way around that, didn't you? Yeah. So, you know, when I started doing microbiome work as a postdoc, I got invited to help other people with a science fair. And as you're saying, like microbes get a bad rap. I, you know, I also wasn't very literate on the good things that microbes do for us when I started studying the microbiome, right? I, for example, didn't know that some vitamins are secreted by our microbes, not by us, right? For example. Um, and um, the other thing, when you go to a science fair, right, a challenge with microbiology that I am sure you encounter too, even when you're teaching, is that by definition, you cannot see microbes. It's not like when you go study or like people don't have an intuition for it, right? People have an intuition for how their own bodies work, but you don't really have an intuition for something that you can't see. So the challenge was how do we attract people to the booth? And then like my solution was like using crochet to create some microbes. And so stealing the words of a journalist here at UF, she said, I make the invisible adorable. And that's really what I try to do. So after seeing my fellow volunteers use the crocheted models to explain a lot of microbiology concepts, that was an aha moment for me. And then I started doing it more and more. So I think here I also have like a cross section of an mRNA nanoparticle from the time of COVID, from when I was doing a lot of COVID vaccine work. So yes, I do a lot of it online, but also try to bring it into like real life interactions as much as possible. But I, I really believe in the power of art to communicate science. And I think art is specifically powerful for us as microbiologists or people interested in microbes because we cannot see them. And so it's just hard for people, including ourselves, to wrap our, head around, our heads around that and those concepts. You know, it's funny you would say this because I can, you know, go purchase Love it. some of this from a company called Giant Microbes. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And I, I hand them out to students. But what you have on your website, and, and, and I just want to make clear that you have instructions for how to crochet your own. And I think there's something about that that's that's deeply wonderful to be able to make your own. Now, I have blunt instruments for fingers, but I'll bet I could learn to do it as well. Yeah, it's not that hard. And like all of my patterns use uh, primarily single crochets, which are the most basic. It's the first stitch you ever learn to crochet. Um, all my patterns have links to YouTube videos. Of I'm not particularly good at teaching people how to crochet, so links to YouTube videos of other people who can teach you how to crochet. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I think you can make your own collection. One thing that I found, especially with children, um, children are very sensorially driven and they really like being able to squeeze them. Um, and, uh, so and sometimes maybe even adults too, but yes, if you go to my website, you'll be able to find your, all uh, the patterns, um, and you'll be able on Ravelry, which is, if if you don't are not a yarn artist or crafter, you're this is gonna be gibber, gibberish to you. you. This is not gonna make any sense to you. But if you are already a crocheter, you know what Ravelry is. You know that it's a database where you can find patterns. You can find my patterns there too, um, and you can create your own and also make them your own if you want and like create your own microbes. And I, I know you've done so much of it, and I, I have some pictures that we're putting up about that, and it's just been wonderful. As we start to kind of move toward closing out the session, if you know, I'd like to ask you this question, and I understand that you are at your heart always an engineer. Can you think of one particular observation that really sold you on my microbiology? So for me, really what brought me to microbiology is all the way at the beginning when you talked about my um, the, uh, the NSF career grant that I just got awarded. It's all kind of full, full circle to that. So when I was, right, you're a PhD student, you want to be a professor, you're supposed to start thinking about what do you see yourself doing in the next, for the rest of your career. And what I was studying before, which was heart valves and traditional tissue engineering, I loved it. But I 
for me, I really wanted to do something where I could be in the future collaborating with people in my home country, in Colombia. That's the vision I have for yeah. myself. And um, I happened to meet uh, Professor Jorge Osorio at the University of Wisconsin at the time. He now leads their Global Health Center, and he studies viruses, really. He studies viruses. Mm -hmm. It was the height of the Zika, if you remember Zika back in like 2016 oh, around the Rio Olympics. And he had like a lab in Colombia, like a lab in Colombia, a lab at, in Madison. And I was like, what? You can do that? And he really inspired me. I was like, okay, what? How can I merge what I know how to do? And then my first idea that I had was like, I had been setting heart valves. There is this one parasite that um, is very prevalent in Colombia and in tropical areas of the world that causes Chagas disease. Oh, yes. Trypanosoma cruzi. And Chagas disease also affects the heart. So that's the first thought that I was like, oh, maybe we can adapt some of these models, engineering models to study Chagas disease. And I kind of became obsessed with that idea. Try to find a postdoc in that and then was not able to convince the infectious disease people who hire me with no like micro or infectious disease expertise. And then through a long series of events, ended up in a microbiome lab. And then kind of things took off from there. But it was really, what really inspired me about microbiology is that um, it's a much older discipline than biomedical engineering, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that there were more ways for me to continue interacting with people in uh, my home country. And, um, and after, you know, that was kind of the entryway. And then once I started learning about the microbiome, I was like, there's just... Why are we not taught about host microbe interactions in our biomedical engineering curriculum? This is both because right in my lab, we study both the commensal microbes and then we also mm -hmm. study straight up pathogens. Um, and so it's like there's just so many things happening like and um, engineers are not as involved in studying these things. And as I'm hoping the paper demonstrates is that through a lot of engineering alone and in engineering this in vitro and ex vivo models will not we can't completely replace doing animal studies and stuff, but I but I hope it's apparent is that at the very least we can maybe accelerate the process of testing hypotheses so that we can narrow down like I see we're saying we can kind of like survey what our initial hypothesis is, maybe yes, in a simplified system, but that can save us hopefully time in the long term. It's reiterative. We keep building on what we knew before. Exactly. And and I also want to say one more thing, and my, my wife, Dr. Jennifer Quinn, is a big believer in this, and I have to change the language just a bit, manifest that blank. And what yeah. she means by that is make it happen for yourself. And that's what you've done. You've manifested yeah. what you wanted. And yes, my guess is you'll you. continue to do so. I mean, I, I hope so. <laughs> oh, I know so, having met you. And I also want to thank you for your time today. And I want to wish your your family and your laboratory group just the very best. And I so appreciate your time. No, thank you. I appreciate the questions. I am so excited that you wanted to discuss that particular paper. I haven't had a chance to discuss it in a podcast contest before. And I also particularly appreciate that you complimented the title because I think of myself as not being particularly good at titles. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have to have you on again to talk about the world microbiome, because I think that's a really interesting topic. I agree. Could not agree more. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode, with wonderful links, can be found at microbe.tv mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Ana Maria Porras is in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Florida. Many, many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and Reber Clark for, as always, the wonderfully quirky music. I hope that you've all enjoyed being part of our Quality Quorum today. See you next time 
on Matters Microbial.